so one of our presenters was amazed that this many people were here, and I said, well, there's drinks later on, so why there's still and it's under lock and key. Uh, so thank you all for coming this afternoon. Uh, we're talking about retrofitting our streets to really about increasing access to parks, schools, and neighborhood destinations. Uh, I think we got a phenomenal panel for you this afternoon. Uh, we have with us Council Member Sally Bagshaw from the City of Seattle, uh, right here. <laughs> Jamie Cheney, who's pitch hitting for Paolo from Seattle Children's Hospital and is uh, new to children. So and Kate Caney with the City of SeaTac, but she will make sure that you know she used to be with Seattle Parks. <laughs> All right, uh, so our, our roadmap, our bike map for today, is um, a little bit of, of why, why we care about this issue of streets, why as landscape architects, why as parks and recreation officials, that matters. We'll then uh, turn it over to Councilmember Bagshaw, who will share with us the view from the dais and, and what it's been like to work within the government uh, to transform our streetscapes. Uh, we'll then talk about the health connection from the Livable Streets Initiative perspective, which is run by uh, Seattle Children's. And then uh, Kate and I will kind of tag team a session about how to actually affect change. What are some of the steps that you can do uh, in your community? But first, So Bryce blew my line about working for Seattle Parks. I was trying to get some street cred with all of you guys. But um, so I thought it would be really helpful to know who is in the audience today. I'm a planner, land use planner, but I'm curious how many of you, and if you don't mind raising your hand, work in different industries. So who's here from Parks and Recreation? And uh, any landscape architects here today? Okay. Anyone from Transportation Planning Public Works? Wow, look at that, that's great. And uh, land use planners? No. Oh, I'm the only one? Okay, <laughs> excellent. All right, um, and then I'm curious uh, who works in the public sector? And, and who's from the private side of it? Okay, really great mixed crowd. Just wanted to understand who we're talking to. Thank you. Oh, yeah, in addition to working at Parks and Rec, my mother is a landscape architect. So. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to launch through the, the why section here. Um, the first thing we need to talk about is health. Uh, this is a map of the U.S. obesity rates over the last 20 some odd years, and you can watch that bottom scale grow over time. We needed to change the scale on the map to track how obese we've become. We should be ashamed. Um, what that means in terms of public health costs, what it means in terms of our well-being, is enormous. And the causes of that are many fold. You know, it's, it's about the food we eat, it's about um, the way we live, but it's also about the built environment that we create. And the public health community has a lot to teach us in this world. And when the public health community looks at um, shaping of the built environment, it really is a foundational issue for them. When they talk about the pyramid of health, what results in individual health, they look at socioeconomic factors as the baseline foundation, where you grew up, what kind of school you attended, whether your parents had good incomes. That's the biggest determining factor. But the next tier above that is really about the context that you grew up in. Could you walk to school? Did you have access to a playground? Did you have um, access to healthy food? Those issues have this huge determining factor on where you go. How you get around is part of that equation, and that's about streets. We also have this conversation around safety. Um, a, a variation of this was shown by Doug Bo this morning. Um, speed kills, right? that's, that's the bottom line. When we start getting uh, speeds above 30 miles per hour, the mortality rate goes, goes through the roof to almost to 90% when you get to 40 miles per hour. That slower speed is really critical. Making sure that our neighborhoods have those slow speeds is gonna improve safety for everyone. So, uh, don't go to the story this morning, which I thought was awesome. <laughs> Our city's traffic engineer met his wife rollerblading on the express lanes of I-5 during one of the closures. <laughs> <laughs> the reason this relates, oxytocin, it's the, the, the love hormone. I talked about this yesterday in another presentation. <laughs> It releases in our, in our bodies when we're having sex, 
it releases when a uh, mother is nursing a, a young baby. It's about, it's the hormone, the biochemical connection between us. There's one other context where it releases, and that's when we're exercising with someone else outdoors. It gets released. So I'm sure your wife is a beautiful person, but it's also those chemicals that work <laughs> We also need to talk about livability and traffic calming. Uh, this is this is an image from a trip that uh, several of us took together, Bob, Sally, Doug Ho, up to Vancouver. And this, there they're thinking about using access to green space, transforming their right-of-ways as part of the equation for both livability and traffic calming, creating these great neighborhoods where it's not about the automobile dominating, automobiles still have access, but they're just doing these street end parks that cut off access, so it's not a car through it, it's a bike through it, it's a pedestrian through it, but it's really a community gathering space. Um, wonderful, wonderful little interventions. And as we layer all these other ideas into what our right of way can be, uh, we can talk about stormwater management, we can talk about citizen engagement, we can talk about crime prevention by having people on the street stewarding their public spaces. Uh, this is a young man, uh, he's a little washed out here by, by the light, but this, this young man right here, uh, he lives in an apartment, he's mid-twenties, he doesn't have access to a garden in, in where he lives. The city of Vancouver has this program where their bioretention cells, their stormwater management cells, they ask citizens to volunteer to step up to plant those cells. They give the citizens uh, some training, they give them some plants to plant, but really, I mean, he is the owner and the steward of this cell. He made these seven little terraces that step down. Uh, there's 500 volunteers just like him all throughout the city. What a phenomenal program. And Dunho reminded us this morning that we already have that volunteer capacity in our city with 1,300 folks who volunteer for our traffic circles already. So what a great opportunity to, to layer on that green stormwater infrastructure, invite volunteers, invite crime prevention uh, into our streetscapes. Vancouver also has this model of making sure that people have access to nearby nature. And this was an example of a, what used to be a streetscape. It used to be uh, you know, a road going straight through here. And they tore it out. They said, let's make this a natural space in front of the school so these kids have a place to gather after school. It's safer. Kid parents can still drop off their kids at this roundabout here, this cul-de-sac. But this is a place where kids, parents, the whole community can come together as nearby nature. We also need to remember that worker productivity is affected by how we transform our streets. When people take active transportation work, they concentrate better, they perform tasks quicker. Uh, from the economic perspective, this is what you need to do to talk to your chambers of commerce about why you're transforming your streets, why you're adding a bike lane, why you're adding sidewalks. Chambers of commerce aren't always so keen on those sorts of things, but talk about to, to them from a worker productivity perspective and you, you're able to break down some walls. Similarly, you can talk about it from a child development and learning perspective. Um, there's, there's studies that show that kids who either walk or bike to school they're actually able to concentrate a half a year ahead of their typical age group of their peers. That mental stimulation of getting to school and having their brain engaged and having their body engaged invites a different level of concentration, a different level of focus when they're in school and their bodies might be a little bit more tired. So the final point I wanted to make was it for us as landscape architects, as parks and recreation officials, uh, and staff members. This is also about reclaiming legacy. Uh, when, when the original cities were laid out, when the Olmsted brothers were out here, they were thinking about the secondary network of street spaces that were open to everyone, that were inviting to all ages. <coughs> and it was a space that was about green, it was about uh, hum hum humane spaces and, and uh, slow seeds. That all ages and ability infrastructure is something that we need to return to. We need to create a network of it. It doesn't mean that every street necessarily needs to be that, but that network needs to be in place. And it can't just be for mammals anymore. Uh, mammals are middle-aged men in lycra. <laughs> a particularly egregious example. Um, we need to create infrastructure that's for all ages and abilities, from grandmothers to young kids. 
So, with that, I want to talk, turn it over to Councilmember Sally Bagshaw, who's really been the leader in this effort in our city. Stand up <laughs> So, you know how once in a while in your life, something happens that is transformational, and you could look back on it, like maybe it was you met your partner, rollerblading, or you did something that you really wish you hadn't and you look back on it. But in March, three years ago, I did something that absolutely revolutionized my life. So I was on city council, and I am on city council, but I have been on city council for about a year, and I went to Portland with a group that was led by SDOT. And Don Ho's then boss was a guy named Peter Hahn, who said to me, you've got to come down and look at Portland Greenways. And that term Greenway was not even in my vocabulary. I had no idea. So I grew up in Portland, um, really loved the city. And he said, well, about four or five of us are going to go. And that was in December. And then he said, well, it's kind of crummy. Let's wait until March. So that four or five, during that couple of months, mushroomed into about 40 people that went down. And we met a guy down there named Mark Lear and Greg Raisman. Greg and I became fast friends because I dropped his camera. <laughs> but I bought him a new one, so he liked that. But we stayed really closely in touch. And he introduced me to this thing that this group, I think they're called Street, well, street Films, had done about Portland. And I took that, that street film and went to every public meeting for about the next year and said, you got to see this. Because it was an exciting opportunity to see a bicycle network of arterials that pedestrians could use as well, and neighbors were using it for community gathering. I absolutely loved it. Then I learned about all ages and abilities. So I've got a brand new granddaughter, and I measure everything by would I take Violet with me on the back of my bike, and is the wherever I'm riding safe enough to do that? So I learned about neighborhood greenways in no small part from a group here in Seattle. And Bob Edmiston here is one of our leaders. Thank you so much. <laughs> Kathy Tuttle, Gordon Bedelford, I don't know if they're in the room today, but they have created this organization that is so grassroots up. We've learned from Portland, we've learned from Vancouver, but I have taken this to city council. And over the last few years, we've gotten money to support our neighborhood greenways. I've also gotten very enthused about what they mean. The 20 miles an hour, you can see the slow speed, and Bryce was talking about that. If you are on your bike and you crash, or if somebody hits you 20 miles an hour, you've got a fighting chance to get up and walk away. But if it's 40 or 45 or more, and you're hit by a car on your bike, um, things are not going to go so well for you. So over the last couple of years, we worked our legislature, worked them hard to follow something, once again, that Portland and Oregon as a whole state had done, and that was to create a 20 mile an hour um, street speed that our traffic engineer could utilize as a tool. So on non-arterial streets, that without going through a million hoops, that SDOT can declare a street a greenway. So the 20 miles an hour is the first piece of it. Speed humps are another thing that we see. We see them in the middle of Portland. I love them, God bless them. They call them sleepy policemen. So there, there are these big humps that you would not want to drive across fast in your car. It's easy for us to go across on our bikes or if we're walking. And Portland actually encourages people to be able to skateboard down the middle of the street, to declare a street a place where a kick the can in summer evenings is not only okay, but it's encouraged. By having the speed humps, cars don't go speeding through. Portland has also taken the stop sign you can see down below. And in this one street called Going, which I, was my first example of it, they took their stop signs and turned them 90 degrees. So Going was a street that, that a bicycle could use and go through without having to stop at every street. But the cars were expected intersecting the streets to stop. So that gave the bicycles a priority. It also, again, allowed pedestrians to play in the street or to jog in the street. And in some areas where we don't have sidewalks, this is an opportunity to say, this is something that really will help with neighborhood connections. 
The safer crossings in the busy streets is one of the biggest problems that we have anywhere because you, you may go along happily in your neighborhood, but then suddenly you come to something like in Portland is the Martin Luther King Roadway, which is actually four lanes in these directions plus parking, I think. So, I mean, you've got a lot of street to cross. So we are learning and taking some lessons out of their book, but also SDOT is leading in some other ways about how do we get safely across the streets. Now this is really a, a big deal. It's a big deal on any major arterial. It's also an important last step getting to our parks. And I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. Oftentimes, and what we're trying to accomplish with our greenways is to make sure people can get where they want to go, whether, they're, whether you're riding your bike to school, like we've had some of these, um, bike connectors, they sometimes are calling them crocodiles, or just the we'll have parents that will be leading by trains. The last couple of blocks getting to school can be really important. And crossing something called, we've got money called Safe Routes to School, so we're leveraging that with some monies that our Parks Department is looking for. The idea is to make the neighborhood as safe and as inviting as possible, so that we don't have to hop in our car and take our kids to school, or hop in our car to go get a um, a quarter mile with the store, but that there are actually ways that people can get around. So that is the goal of our neighborhood greenways. So here is an example of the neighborhood greenway coalition that has been just started here in Seattle by the Seattle Neighborhood Greenways Group. And you can see the green spaces around there. Are there are over 20 organizations now, 20 There's something if you count the green spaces. 23. <laughs> but amazing. Yo. Oh, I can you get that back there? Sorry, there was, is that a little better? We'll see if she and I can avoid hitting the line. How's that? Okay, well, so we've got 20 plus organizations that are community organized. This is not the government going out and saying, we want you to create a greenway. These are people who have said, this is what we want, and we want to be able to connect from one neighborhood to the other. You can imagine if we accomplish the goals that we have right now in our bicycle master plan, uh, 250 miles of neighborhood greenways and interconnected cycle tracks, that Seattle will be the place that people will want to come and ride the bike. You may have heard that the Chicago mayor, God bless him, has thrown down the gauntlet and said they are going to build bicycle lanes and, buy, and build a pedestrian network because they want our jobs. They know that if they have the ability to get around without having to drive their car, that people who are young, vibrant, interested, and those of us who are considered in the senior category now, that if we've got safe ways to get around, that that's where we're going to go. So one of my council member colleagues, Tom Rasmussen, is a good friend of the Chicago mayor, and, he's, and so they have this little sparring match going back and forth. But the idea is, Chicago said, we're going to take your jobs, we're going to take your people, we're going to get them because we're going to be building this cool infrastructure. So, Currently, in Seattle, I will be the first to say that our streets are not designed for all. Um, I tell people that when I used to live out in Lake Forest Park and I worked at the University of Washington, that I would ride my bike, and it was about a 22, 24 mile an hour, mile round trip. And that was great, and I was safe, and I was separated, but I don't bounce like I used to. <laughs> so I want to have a very safe and separated network that goes from neighborhood to neighborhood, it also is through downtown. So this is something we've been pushing. Um, our Seattle City Council is very enthused about it. The Bicycle Master Plan was just brought to us on Tuesday and got out of the Transportation Committee unanimously. We will be voting on it on Monday. And this is a big deal because we've been working on this for a couple of years. Our first Bicycle Master Plan was what, 2007, Don and a lot has happened. Many of you know about the new NAPTO standards. The NAPTO standards are something that's been adopted by the Federal Highway Administration even. And the goal of that is to say, we're going to use tools differently than we have, but really to encourage people to use alternative modes than just driving our car by ourselves. So here's a, a, um, an example. I believe this picture was taken um, down in Rainier, not in Rainier Valley in our own city. But just getting kids across the street it's so hard, especially, you know, especially if you've got little guys like this that are four and five year olds, you know that they scatter in a million different directions. So we want to make sure that our kids can get across safely. And my goal, the, the metaphor that I use, is whatever we decide to do, I want it to be so good and so safe that I would let an eight year old ride a bike by herself 
on that street. So that's my gold standard, is that if, if we would let our eight-year-olds do it, then it's going to be safe enough for me. So here's just another example about designing our streets for the little kids, but also for the seniors. We are, in Seattle, moving up to a 20% population over 65 years old. I want to age in place. I want to age in this city. I want you to be able to as well. And I also want you to be able to drive around with your kids and feel that you can have a safe place and it's really cool connection as we can make it. So I don't know if you can see this little girl up in the right hand corner. This is my absolute favorite. Standards and evaluation. This is getting the whole community involved. Here you've got the six year old with a, a traffic speed camera checking out and taking data. This is the kind of work that our neighborhood greenways are doing. They're providing the information and the data to SDOT. And what I've encouraged people is don't go tell SDOT how to do it. Just tell them what your end goal is. Bring the neighbors together so that the neighbors can tell us what do we want, because every neighborhood is different, every connection is different. And on city council, we're listening to that. So my goal is to make sure that the policies are in place that we get the money to do the design, to do the actual construction, and to be able to connect where people want to go. So it can be done. We have seen this in Portland, and I keep coming back to Portland because they're my nemesis. I love it. They're always ahead of us in something. You know, they're always doing something really cool that we haven't bought yet. In Portland, they had, when we were there three years ago, they had 65 miles of these neighborhood greenways. And at that point, I think we were planning our first one um, in Wallingford. So, you know, now I think they've got 70, but we now have 250 miles on the map. So I'm saying, you know, we're going to make it happen. Bryce mentioned Vancouver. My goodness. Um, since my first Portland trip three years ago, I've been to Copenhagen to see what they have done. Vancouver, BC, a group of us went last summer. And learning from what these other cities are doing, we can bring these back. And what the city of Seattle is doing now that I just absolutely love is we've got great people in SDOT that are wanting to do this, but we also are coordinating with Seattle City Light as they're doing construction, Seattle Public Utilities. <coughs> and the SPU director is a guy named Ray Hoffman, who's also a bicyclist himself. And I said to him, here's what I really want out of SPU this year. I want us to be able to do, like the picture that Bryce showed on Vancouver, where they have those little corner gardens. They've taken the last 30 feet back from the stop signs. Well, you're not supposed to park your car, but people do anyway when they just decide, you know, forget it, there's a spot on taking it. But those green spaces can serve as wonderful collectors, filtration systems. It keeps water from, you know, going into our combined sewer overflow. And they're absolutely beautiful. What Vancouver has done that I love is that they have this little competition going. They've got 500 of these gardens. There's little signs that say, you know, adopt me, I'm yours. People are taking them over neighborhoods and doing it. They've got to be challenges. I mean, so many of these gardens look like something right out of Queen Elizabeth Gardens. I was just astonished. Beautiful way of combining the need for a water collection with greening up. And they've got a million tree challenge as well where they've actually taken some of their streets and said, we're planning parks there. Cars have, have had priority long enough in some of the neighborhoods. They're saying, we're going to stop. We're going to stop cars from driving through. You can ride your bike through. You can walk through. But they've been planting trees right smack in the middle of the street to add to their goal of the million trees. So I am about to pass this over. Um, I, I don't know, Jamie, are you picking up here? What I want to say is the enthusiasm that we have seen in the city. Here's a document that um, it's online. It's called Seattle Neighborhood Greenways, and it was done by some students at the University of Washington in conjunction with Gala Architects, in conjunction with our Seattle Neighborhood Greenway group. This, this book shows all kinds of examples. Um, here's what is especially delightful. If you haven't done this before, in the very last two pages of this book is how do you organize your community? The Residence Guide for Working with the City. Right across it is how to organize, how to define the scope of the product, um, the information, educating and motivating your neighborhoods, identifying routes, talking to people about what those routes could look like, then exploring your funding, your collaborative alliances, how do we leverage this money? That's a big thing right now. We've got parks opportunities, we've got Seattle Public Utilities, Seattle City Lions doing construction projects. Being able to take these departments, leverage the funds is great. Then prioritizing, 
capital, capitalizing on the momentum, and, and valuing and improving. So all of this, as I said, was done by University of Washington students. It's a great tool. Um, it's on the website. You can find it if you want to um, And I just really recommend this to you. If this is something new to you, here's a great toolkit. So um, thank you very much. I'll be around for the questions. I just want you to know that our government and the city of Seattle is behind us all the way. And I suspect that those of you who are from out of town can take some of the lessons that we've learned and to teach us as you go. So thank you very much. Jamie, you're on. Good afternoon. My name is Jamie Cheney. I'm at Seattle Children's Hospital. Can you hear me in the back? Is this all right? Yep. Great. I can't see you, though. <laughs> <laughs> I might have to move the background. <laughs> Uh, thank you for uh, having me here today to uh, uh, to share with you um, how Seattle Children's Hospital has uh, taken a lot of these ideas and implemented them, uh, and that's what I want to share with you today. Um, I'm relatively new at Seattle Children's Hospital, and I'm delighted to be at Seattle Children's. I've uh, worked in Seattle for uh, many years in the transportation industry, and I've always been in awe of what Children's does, and I'm um, Really excited to be on the inside. I've been here for a couple of months. Prior to that, I worked in downtown Seattle at an organization called Commute Seattle, and we worked with private businesses and property owners to help them um, uh, design and implement commute trip reduction programs. Um, and then before that, I worked at Zipcar, uh, managing the Seattle uh, market when um, car sharing was little known. Actually, it was Flexcar. I don't know how many of you have heard of Flexcar, uh, but I've done that for. Uh, a long period of time. So, delighted to be here at Children's and to share with you what they've been up to. See if I can work this. So, what I'd like to do is give you a little bit of uh, the private sector perspective on uh, retrofitting streets. And to do that, I'll give you a little bit of uh, history and context to Children's, um, share with you our current modes with how people get to work because that um, is a lot of what we're trying to solve. And uh, livable streets is also one of the solutions um, to helping uh, get our employees to work and also um, help our neighbors uh, get around the community. And livable streets is essentially our initiative to retrofit streets. So um, I'll describe why we uh, engaged in livable streets, um, how we selected our projects, and um, I'll show you some of those highlights. So first of all, just an introduction to Children's. We are uh, the region's largest children's hospital, and we provide specialty care to children uh, in four states, Alaska, Montana, Idaho, and Washington. And uh, while the majority of our services are located uh, in our main hospital in Seattle, and in fact in the Laurel First neighborhood, not too far from here, um, about 42% of the children that we serve do not come from King County, so it really is a regional um, specialty medical center. So this is our footprint in Seattle. Um, we have three main locations in Seattle. Our hospital, which is the uh, most well-known for nearly a century, has been located in the residential neighborhood of Laurelhurst, which um, if you came here on the same point way, you passed it. And if you go back out, uh, check it out, it'll be on your left-hand side. Uh, that's our hospital that has our specialty services. We have our research uh, uh, group in downtown Seattle. And then uh, increasingly, we're trying to uh, decentralize our services out to where our, our patients and families are. And we have a Bellevue clinic. So um, Seattle Children's is, um, has for a while not been able to meet the demand for children's, um, children's uh, specialty needs. And essentially what that means is we don't have enough beds. And so for, um, for about a decade now, Children's has been looking to expand their services, and that specifically means on our Laurelhurst campus. And uh, to give you an idea about our campus, the uh, yellow outline is our original uh, boundary for our hospital. And we've been working with the city to um, expand, which is represented by the red uh, outlying area. 
so that we can build some more facilities and more beds and be able to treat more children. So we worked with the city, um, started working with them, I believe it was about 2007, to create a major institution master plan. And that major institution master plan would guide our development for the next 20 years. And part of that um, um, development would also, so there's one of uh, a new building that we in fact just built. That's uh, 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 cancer and critical care for children right on our campus. Uh, so that master plan allows us to build, allow us to build this building and another building, but as part of that uh, as part of that master plan, we also had to put together a comprehensive transportation plan. And there are four main elements to that, and I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on all the elements, but I just want to run, run through it quickly. One is we needed to re reduce vehicle traffic. Uh, we needed to uh, reduce drive alone trips to 30% of our daytime employees. Um, and our commitment to that was uh, several million annually to do that, and there are many elements of that, but uh, it has a lot to do with really aggressively managing our parking. We have uh, a shuttle service, we have uh, free bikes, we have a free transit pass for our employees. So those are really the programmatic elements. Another is uh, traffic flow efficiencies. We needed to reduce uh, delay on the main arterials that go around the city. Um, by 15, uh, 10 to 15% uh, in the next 20 years. Um, you can see the investment there, and uh, it's in partnership with the city for an intelligent transportation system. The third is improved bike and walk infrastructure in the neighborhood uh, to generate a significant increase in bike and walk. And uh, that's, um, it says two million up there. It's really a $4 million investment. The $2 million investment is what you're gonna see today which is nearly a completion. Uh, and we call that livable streets. And I'll share that with you in a minute. And then the last is that when we do build something that uh, we create a built environment that supports uh, good access, uh, safe, safe, safety, uh, great pedestrian flow, bikes, showers, lockers for bicyclists. Um, but it's the, the first two, excuse me, the first one and the second one that I really want to focus on today, but you can tell it's part of a comprehensive package of things that allow us um, to develop over the next 20 years and be compliant with uh, the city. So it's those two I'm going to uh, focus on. So just to give you a little bit of background about our, our um, the way people get to work at Seattle Children's. Um, the gray section, the biggest section, those are our, our drive alone commuters, or our SOP commuters. And they're less than 40% of our employees. So the rest, which is about 61%, do not drive alone to work. And they take all of these other different modes. Um, transit is a significant one, car pulling bike. Uh, bike is 8.6%, uh, which is pretty high. Uh, and walk, which is 6%. Uh, so today we have a really great code split. We didn't get there overnight. We've had very aggressive programs um, to, to get us there. Uh, our goal is 30%. So um, push down that 38.5, another 8.5 percentage points. And just to give you, um, give you some context, I used to work in downtown Seattle doing the very same thing. And downtown Seattle also has a goal, and that's um, also to achieve a 30% drive on rate. And so we have similar goals. And I would just like to add that, you know, all roads lead downtown Seattle. It's a very rich place for transportation and for access. All roads do not lead to Laurelhurst. Uh, but that's our challenge, is to uh, create uh, the pathways to children that will allow people to get out of their cars and get to work. So I thought I would just uh, mention a couple of things that we do that I think um, are really fairly unique to children's. And one is that we really um, manage, uh, we use transportation demand management to, to really leverage the assets that we have. Uh, one of those being parking. And uh, I just want to mention, park, parking on the left-hand side, we really work hard at reducing demand for parking by our employees. And there's three factors up here that are really key in doing that. And in my experience, a lot of businesses want to um, really put everything on the other side of the scale, which is to increase demand for other uh, alternative tricks uh, and options but they don't really do a lot to really reduce demand for parking. And so Children's um, does by three main ways. One, there is no free parking on campus. 
everybody pays every day of the week, every hour of the day. That's kind of unusual. Two, um, everybody pays, regardless of your, your job title or classification, so even physicians are paying for parking every single day. You don't find that in every hospital. Um, and then the other is there are no monthly parking uh, permits. When you issue a monthly parking permit, that incents people to park for 22 or 30 days a month. We want to unbundle that and unbundle people's thinking about parking, and so we only have daily rates. So you have to think about it every time that you park. And then, so on the other side of the of the uh, the scale, there we um, we have another unique thing, which is not only do we charge you to park every day, we pay you when you don't park. So if you come to work by transit, carpool, vehicle, bus, or bike, we'll pay you four dollars a day. That's called our commute bonus, and that's fairly um, unique. So uh, and. Uh, people want that bonus, <laughs> so it uh, works really well. So we also have free bikes, free bus passes, free shuttles for our employees, and all sorts of other best-in-class um, transportation benefits. But it's really um, the things on this side of the house that really tip the scale, I think, as well as the community bonus. So we have a, a goal, and it's to get to 30% uh, by 2028. We have a long way to go, um, but we've made some really great strides, and. Um, uh, the dotted line is the needed, uh, where we need to get to, and the red is where we are today. And as you can see, we're, we're directionally correct, but we really got to bend the, bend the curve. And uh, we've already got some really innovative things in place, so we need to really dig deep to get that other 8.5%. We think we can do it, but we have to be pretty aggressive and, and innovative. So this brings us uh, to livable streets, and this is part of that package, that comprehensive transportation package. Um, and um, the goal with livable streets was to make uh, northeast Seattle, or the neighborhood that, in which we live, uh, a better place to bike and walk. And what we did was uh, committed four million dollar investment uh, to uh, make. Uh, to increase the mobility in that neighborhood. And we focused on three areas. One is uh, to develop greenways that are proximate to um, Children's Hospital, uh, to improve trail connections, and the trail specifically is the Burke Mellon Trail, we'll talk about that in a minute, and then crossing improvements. Uh, um, children's in the neighborhoods has lots of arterials, and to get people back and forth, we need to make sure that those crossings were uh, better. So, I can tell you about the projects and we'll walk through them, but I think this is maybe one of the most sort of important takeaways is why did we do it? Why are we making these investments? And it's because it's really a statement of value for children. And um, there are a lot of reasons uh, that that reflects our values. Uh, the first is community. Uh, the, the neighborhood, specifically the Laurelhurst community, has been a partner all along from the very beginning. Um, and I don't mean of just a major institution master plan, but from the beginning, since we've been in Laurelhurst, they've um, really been uh, engaged in uh, what Children's does and how we do it. So, so Livable Streets is a way to engage them and to reflect their values as well as ours on how to improve, improve the area. Uh, the second is access. I uh, should have, if I didn't, uh, mention that Children's um, aims to treat any child regardless of their ability to pay um, for their care. And so access is a, is a real value of children's and I think that's also reflected through physically here, which is Livable Streets is about connection and access for all ages and all abilities and all incomes. You'll see the connections that we've made and anybody uh, of any different age, ability, or income, whether you're a patient or an employee, could if you chose to want to um, connect to children's uh, by any of these improvements we've made. Um, health is obviously a big issue, and there are a lot of things here that uh, reflect our values here. One is, uh, as you know, uh, active uh, transportation, active lifestyles, um, livable communities make uh, children and families more active and, and more healthy, so there's a, a direct connection there. Um, Safety is also a big uh, issue for children. So not only are we treating children and trying to cure and prevent uh, uh, disease, uh, but we're also addressing injuries many times for children. And so uh, safety is a big issue, and um, we're committed to making safe environments for children. 
Um, and then, um, the, when we're taking cars off the road or allowing people to get to the grocery store or to the park without jumping into a car, we're reducing the, the greenhouse gases and the particulate matter that's in the air. And um, this has a particularly um, interesting connection to children's, and that is uh, the number, the, uh, the second reason, second most admittances at children's is for childhood asthma. And so we see, we see a real connection there. And then lastly, uh, you saw a lot of the, the programs and parking and um, uh, 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 programs that create really valuable transportation benefits. What you're going to see are really infrastructure improvements that are quite complementary to those programmatic elements. So um, most of what we've done at Children's thus far in events are internal, and these were really external expressions of our, of our uh, commitment to uh, mobility. So the first thing we did was assess um, our assets. And one of them is that we live in a residential neighborhood. And this is a, um, uh, uh, describes how many people live uh, near children's within walking distance. So those radius are uh, one, two, and three miles. And we have about 800, and, uh, about 800 employees that live within three miles of of campus, and so they could reasonably walk there, especially if they had better connections. So uh, we thought that we could leverage that. The second is we have this gem, which is called the Bird Dillon Trail. It's an 18 mile at grade trail that winds through uh, countless neighborhoods in North Seattle, which uh, goes near Children's Hospital. And it's a, it's a huge asset, except for the fact that it's, well, first of all, it's kind of like a walk and bike highway except for the fact that there's no offering at Children's. Uh, the offering is either before Children's or after Children's and dumps people out into a, um, an arterial and not a very safe way to, uh, to get to work. So we were looking at how to improve connections to uh, the Burke Hillman Trail and really leverage that. So one of the other um, assets we have, as I uh, mentioned earlier, is this uh, neighborhood that was really engaging. We went out to the neighborhood we asked what they wanted, we got lots of input, we had charrettes and open houses, um, we did bike tours, uh, so we got a lot of input and we collected about 100 different projects that uh, the community wanted. And uh, we needed to narrow those down, but uh, and on this map you can see about 15 of them, we narrowed them down to 15, and the ones in red, excuse me, the ones encircled in yellow are the first phase of our livable streets and we narrowed it down to about seven. So we have a couple different phases. What I'm going to show you is uh, phase one and uh, the projects are completed. Um, the first is we identified many places where we could um, develop a greenway. You, um, Sally described to you a greenway uh, and the great elements and characteristics of the greenway. We identified that we could potentially do four of them, we narrowed it down to one and it's 39th Street. This one right here. We chose that because uh, it's got great connectivity to the Burke Hill and Trail, which is right here. Our campus is here. Um, there are schools in blue and um, parks in gray. And uh, we chose 39th and um, made improvements on um, about 15 different uh, there we go intersections. We uh, put, uh, worked with the city to put um, curb cuts, reduce parking in the corners, put in planting strips. Um, put in crosswalks so that uh, regardless of age and ability. You can maneuver up and down the street and um, enjoy it walking, biking, or playing outside. And this uh, does deliver a lot of uh, employees to work every day. Whether they're coming from North Seattle or Northeast Seattle, they can just connect through the greenway here and um, zip down it in a protected uh, fashion and get right to work. The other thing we did was create a uh, short but uh, I call the uh, cycle track right out in front of the hospital. And we created a, a five foot sidewalks and a 10 foot bi-directional cycle track. 
and uh, it's right outside front, right out, right out front. And as a standalone project, um, um, it doesn't get a lot of use today. However, the next project that I'm going to show you really links these uh, things together that I've just shown you, and will really uh, get together do the things that we want to do here. So here's the greenway. Greenway. I just showed you the cycle track that's out front, and then the next thing we did, and it's going to uh, be finished this month, is a connection to the Burke Island Trail, which is right here. So essentially, people come down here, zip off there, go down the cycle track, and come into Children's. And uh, there's a better picture of it right there. The cycle track. We did a improved the crossing at 40th and Sandpoint Way, and then there's the the connection to Burke Island. When you uh, leave tonight, as you go home, you um, can see this as you drive by on your left. So I'll check it out if you like. So uh, that's almost completed and should be finished by the end of the month. We have a lot of other projects and we'll uh, embark on our phase two of livable streets. But um, that concludes those uh, projects. And um, you're all invited to a celebration. As we close the first phase of our livable streets and those uh, seven projects, um, we want to celebrate them. So um, we want to share and introduce uh, to the neighborhood the investments and um, also promote their use. Some people know they're there, some people don't. So we want to make sure that people understand what's there and how to use them. So we're inviting about 40,000 neighbors. Um, schools in the areas, uh, our partners and employees want to invite the walking tours. Uh, in case anybody's going to give out uh, bike to school awards at that event, the bike rodeo, and give out some helmets to make sure that uh, people are safe as they're biking. That's all I have. Thank you. Thanks. Take you out of the city of Seattle context for a second and talk about some suburbs and uh, use it as an opportunity to talk about what some lessons we've learned are, uh, about how you would step through this process if you were sitting inside of a city today. Um, and I think the, the most important one we've already heard about, is, which is about articulating your goal, whether it's making sure that your city is safe for, for all ages and abilities, 8 to 80. Uh, Vision Zero, Target Zero, some of these are, you know, these are the brand names that people have put out there. Uh, complete streets, making it safe for all users and all modes. Say what it is you're trying to achieve in a way that is not, <coughs> does not sound like it's written out of a manual, that is relatable to everyone's life. 8 to 80, you know people who are 80, you know people who are 80. That's immediately manageable. It's a, it's a powerful statement, and it helps elected officials, I, I think Sally would agree, <coughs> make that case to, to people who might have some doubts. So for the city of uh, Maple Valley, uh, out in uh, South King County, articulating their goal was about capitalizing on their existing assets. They have a phenomenal, phenomenal backbone, which is the Lake Wilderness Trails. Uh, King County calls it the Green Cedar Rivers Trail. In their community, they call it the Lake Wilderness Trail. Their opportunity, what they wanted to do, was increase access to that trail and make it really be the backbone of their community. Do you want to talk about what your goal is? Okay, I'm going to talk about uh, the city of SeaTac's goal. Um, city of SeaTac uh, embarked on a process through the communities putting prevention to work, uh, and and for them, you know, the, the grant became the catalyst for doing for doing work. And it was the grant was really cranking around. Um, reducing health disparities within their community. So King County generally has pretty good health if you look at it as aggregate data, but within individual communities, there can be these really big disparate uh, uh, distances between the lower quartiles and the higher quartiles in terms of our, our uh, economic strata. And the goal of that grant was really to reduce those disparities. Um, the way that that translated then to the city of SeaTac was adopting a complete streets ordinance and making sure that their city was accessible, their public works projects were accessible for all ages, or all users and all modes. So the second step is really about assessing your physical assets. Now I'll return here to, to the city of Maple Valley. They had this awesome trails uh, that was an old railroad grade, the future birth building of Maple Valley, but they also had 
these types of streets. They had a typical suburban uh, Euclidean <laughs> zoning, uh, very segregated land uses. Like, here's where the commercial core was. Here's where all the housing subdivisions are. Um, and so they had very big streets in some places and very modest streets in other places. So how is that an asset? What could we do with, with that structure to, to transform it? The great thing that Maple Valley had that some other communities don't have is whoever their planner was, they baked into the code that when you do these subdivisions, they had to have these small scale pedestrian connections to the adjacent property. And in this case, this is, this is a small scale little pedestrian connection that gets this neighborhood to the school. So instead of the, the horror story uh, line that we always see where someone has to walk three miles around to get their kid to school, it was, it was a 500 foot walk. So that was a phenomenal asset that we could build on in Maple Valley. We also have social assets. And I just want to clarify a little bit for CTAC. Actually, what we were doing with SVR Design a couple of years ago was creating a policy document. The Safe and Complete Streets Plan, unfortunately, is not a complete streets ordinance. That would be a goal, listening to, about Seattle and Seattle Children's and the amazing things programmatically that are happening is so inspiring. And in CTAC, we're at a higher level. We're creating a policy document, our, our first non-motorized plan. And so we walked through some of these steps um, that Bryce was talking about, looking at our assets. I have to say, looking at the grid in Seattle makes me so jealous. We do not have that. Curious real quick, how many of you work for suburban cities? Yeah, that grid is pretty amazing in these older cities like Seattle. And in SeaTac, we just don't have that. We don't have a lot of understanding about the importance of streets in these contexts that we're talking about today. So our step was to do this policy document. And one of the first things that we had to do was figure out how are we going to talk to our community. And in SeaTac, like in many places in South King County, it is very diverse. SeaTac is also a little more interesting, I think, because we have a population that's lived there for a long time. Maybe they came in the 50s, 60s, or 70s to work for Boeing or work as a pilot at the airport. That those families are still there. And then we have a very large immigrant population. Uh, people who don't speak the language, people who aren't familiar with governments, people who fear the government. So how do we access those people and how do we give them information and get input from them is something that we had to really think long and hard about. So we knew that we couldn't just have the traditional city hall meeting. We couldn't put out the flyer and expect people to come. We couldn't put out an email. We didn't have email addresses. Who has a computer anyway? I mean, that's really a concern for us in CTAC. So we figured we need to find where people come where lots of people come and where diverse people come. Ah, the schools. Schools have lots of kids from all over the place. We have over 100 languages spoken commonly in our school. So we partnered with three elementary schools, and we were lucky enough to work with very uh, kind school communities who led us into their movie nights. We learned a lot about trying to work with, um, and that's one of our council members at one of these movie nights, um, with school populations who were really there to see a movie, let's be frank. Did they want to do our questionnaire? Well, you have to make it interesting. So we would have raffles. We had uh, color pages for kids to draw. We got more participation from those meetings than most of the meetings that I've been to in the last seven years at SeaTac. And we learned a lot. This isn't really a lessons learned um, time, but I'd love to share those ideas with you about what worked, what didn't work, and how I would really order pizza for everyone ahead of time to get their information before they watch the movie. That's, that's the big reason. <laughs> but um, it was an amazing opportunity to partner with our school, partner with those communities, and open a door. And in fact, um, we're working on our um, third light rail station area plan right now. We're going to have three light rail stations serving SeaTac, and many of those lessons learned about how to access those communities are really bearing fruit now. So. It's very important if you want to get to the right people, you really have to think of strategies that fit your community's needs. So. We're dancing. <laughs> uh, there's also what's the driver? You know, there's opportunities to graft on whatever whatever your agenda is onto other moving targets. So, is there an LID ordinance? Is the stormwater code being updated? Is there safe routes to school funding? Is there complete streets funding coming out of uh, national organizations? What are those things that you can use that are already deeply held values in your community or that you already have a champion at the elected official level that you can begin to graft onto and use it as a, as a, as a, as a, 
a little seed to plant, plant the, the pilot for, this, for, the, for your uh, street transformations. Articulate those big opportunities. What is it that is imageable that gets elected officials excited? Again, the trail about creating this backbone for the community. Um, or for, for, for the folks in Maple Valley, it wasn't just this trail, which goes right through the middle of the community and has a limited um, kind of group who care about it. It was about getting that trail out into the neighborhoods. And that's where the neighborhood greenways came in. We said, yes, we're going to make a great trail, but we're also going to give access to that trail to every single one of your neighborhoods. Aha, now I like it. Now I'm going to let an official. That is exciting for me. For the city of SeaTac, it was similarly, you know, getting the, what really resonated, I think, at council, what broke down the walls was imagining the kids and imagining seniors. Everyone understood that. And getting kids to school safely was such an easy one. It was like it was it was the, the table that everyone could come around. So that was really exciting. Pilot, try it out. Try some experiments. Not everything's going to work the first time. You have great data from cities who have pioneered this. You can use that to test out, record that data, uh, and use it to adopt, adapt, and implement over time. This is uh, the city of Maple Valley. Here's their existing trail network. Here's the main spine. Here's the built out all the red lines going into their neighborhoods, their neighborhood greenway system, connecting all their neighborhoods back to that trail, back to their parks that they have throughout the community, really built along that spine. Really exciting. Your turn. Okay. Okay, this is my other slide. Okay. All right. so, um, so this is the plan that is still actually not adopted by our city council. Our city council endorsed this by resolution a couple years ago and said, oh, we're going to punt this to the comp plan. They didn't punt it. They actually knew that we were doing a major comp plan update. And that's what we're working through right now. And actually, it's been great because some of the council members um, have changed. And this is another opportunity right now as we're creating a transportation master plan to talk about what this non-motorized plan means and to have new conversations about well, maybe we should do that complete streets ordinance. Maybe we should put a little more teeth into it. So actually coming out round two is really important to us. But again, working at the policy level to get the policies together and to get council on the literally the same page as the community is extremely important. And that's why for our city, this step is a huge step for us and it's helped laying the groundwork for what we can do and hopefully along the lines of Seattle and what Seattle Children's is trying to do. We have one more. <laughs> oh, and then it's great if you get an award, if you get good press, and you can stand up with Rice's colleague here. No, Rice didn't make it to that. But that also, the more that the conversation is positive, the more you turn those doubters who are like, why are we spending money on bikes? Bikes shouldn't be on the road. Well, look, this is a, a you know, a, a, this is at the ATA um, Planning Association of Washington award ceremony last year. We got an award for this draft plan, and it helps it you know, stay relevant, it gives it legs, and it helps us as we move into the adoption process. So, um, awards are always cool. <laughs> <laughs> and since I knew Sally was going to mention the street films, uh, sharing successes by street films. Either create your own internally, or invite Clara to come to your community and tell your story. I mean, this is the one, the Portland uh, bike, bike, way, bike Boulevard has become neighborhood greenways. You can see both Greg uh, and Mark, who Sally mentioned, in this video, but it's a short five-minute video. It was what we held, what we had in our public meetings for Maple Valley to get to plant the seed for, for uh, neighborhood greenways there. And it's so easy and it's so compelling. And you see these kids, you see people out there riding their bikes together, walking together, talking together. It's, it's the easiest politics you can ever do. So with that, thank you. And we got, I think we have 15 minutes for questions and answers at this point. I think we're all going to stand up for the on stage. here to Seattle, like I'm just amazed by how many people 
bike as a lifestyle. You know, they, they commute by bike, they, they race as biking teams, and me being the runner and walker, like riding on the Burke Gilman, being on the Burke Gilman, it is really a bike superhighway. And, you know, I almost feel like some of these things, you know, to make things safe for an eight-year-old that you guys are talking about in the livable streets, I mean, they also apply to trails as well. But I'm just wondering, like, how do you guys see the livable streets working with the networks that we have to make things safe for all users? And like, you know, how, how is it improving things or what are the challenges? So I lived in Lake Forest Park, as I mentioned, for 20 years. And even 20 years ago, it was a bike superhighway. And people have always said, oh, you've got to separate the bicycles from the pedestrians. And that's a fact. And what I have urged the, the mammals to do, you know, the guys that are riding... She points at me. <laughs> 18, 18 miles an hour to 20 miles an hour on that trail is way too fast. Because you've got kids, you've got people that are walking their dogs and the dog's leash is 20 feet out. You know, it just, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So with Brooke Gilman, I mean, I just plead with everybody, recognize that this is bicycles, and it's pedestrians, and it's skaters, and it's babies, and we got to take care of each other. That's the only way that's going to work. But switch to Copenhagen, for example. Oh my goodness. So they have giant boulevards where cars are driving. But I think it's like 37% of the people ride their bikes to work. Now granted, it's flat, but they're their um, weather is worse than ours in terms of cold and ice, but still, even in the snow, 37% of the people are riding their bikes to work because they prioritize the bike lanes, and they've got little, um, oh, Dr. Hall's got a great one. So uh, uh, the way that we're going to address uh, facilities for different users, obviously, um, there's Maybe always... Yeah, that. Yeah, so uh, the way that uh, staff is going to prioritize facilities for different users is that the uh, main facilities for our most vulnerable users, which are, which are our older users and inexperienced users. And so that neighborhood greenways, I mean, they're really low speeds. If anything that happens, it's pretty much stuck on, on a sidewalk. So that's our paradigm. We're going to have these connections that will connect to where you want to go on a neighborhood street so you can learn how to ride. And they'll connect to the regional system that is also at 8 to 80. Uh, so that it will be on arterial streets. It will be a protected facility for you. You'll feel very comfortable. If you're a fast rider, you're going to be filled very penned in, very uncomfortable. We want to be on the street. That's why we want faster and more vehicular uh, riders to be in. And if you're in that facility where uh, it's really the 8 to 80, uh, then you know, you're know you expected to uh, use caution and, and obviously etiquette. Um, that's the long term. That's what happens in Copenhagen is that people self-regulate. If someone is speeding, you know, someone will say, hey, slow down. Uh, if someone is not signaling, someone, someone will uh, yell at them at the next, next stoplight. And so that it, it self-polices. And then what we're seeing right now is that we are not at that critical point, and we're starting to get there. You'll actually hear people yell at others, saying, you're putting me at risk by blowing through that stop sign, because everybody seeing that behavior is attributing that to my behavior as well, even though I'm uh, being very safe. And, and I'll just add from the infrastructure design perspective, two things. Is anyone from the University of Washington here? Are you guys transportation folks? Okay, so I'm going to talk for Josh a little bit. Um, the University of Washington is looking at that exact issue going through as a bird guild in front of their campus. And so there is a proposal. Uh, they tried to get Tiger funding. It didn't go through uh, the last round to separate pedestrians from cyclists through the Berkeley corridor going through the University of Washington. One of the things that we heard when we went up to Vancouver, we met with public works officials uh, and we met with a couple of parks officials, but perspectives that we heard from people who were outside of the city government was that public works was doing phenomenal work in inviting cyclists onto the streets where they were having a hang up. Uh, their, their parks board is independent, it's, it's kind of separate from city government the parks bikes interaction was actually their issue. When you go around Stanley Park, the conflicts there are enormous. Uh, and, and some of the issues that you talked about, the ped bike stuff, the, the urban dog walker, those those were issues that weren't really adequately be adequately being addressed from an enforcement uh, infrastructure side from the parks board up in Vancouver. Uh, and uh, okay, so I'll do the plug now. Uh, that's why it's exciting. Uh, 
with the MPD proposal that the council Seattle, is reviewing. Seattle there. Park District. Seattle Parks District. I like it. Seattle, Seattle, Seattle Park District. Okay, we have, we have adopted. Um, there is money in there for integrating that bicycle infrastructure into parks and make sure that when people get to those parks, they're not going to be screaming in there and knocking everyone over. It's really about creating a safe environment for everyone. Continuing the plug, three hundred thousand dollars annually dedicated to neighborhood greenway connections to parks. And that, over years, will make a huge difference. And thank you to Bryce, who was on the committee. <laughs> yeah, Paul. Cool. Um, one of the, in the more northerly just from uh, OUW uh, north, one of the challenges is east-west um, connections. And uh, in the not too distant past, when Mayor McGinn um, introduced us to engineering, uh, 125th, we were a lot, most of us were skeptical of it, and it, it actually worked well, but the thing that does not work well is the bicycle lane. It's just simply too steep, uh, either going down or up, and most people are uncomfortable with it. And sort of a curiosity question is, how can we create better routes, say, through neighborhoods? Because typically, the single family is naturally slower. And they're often less steep than the arterials. And um, I know there's a bikeway plan, but it, it seems like at that sort of fine grain scale that perhaps the residents um, have a really good idea where the routes are. So how can we get that localized knowledge to, to help us with our bike? So I think you'd be very pleased to know how much localized knowledge is actually happening. And I will agree with you about 120. Uh, that's an area that I lived in. I know what it's like. That street is not a place where I would take my granddaughter, either up or down. And I think that um, SDOT would be the first department to say, we're learning. And that would not have been the best approach. So it's paint. That's all it is, is paint at this point. So it could be changed. And with the neighborhood greenways, I should have brought the whole neighborhood greenway now. It is very impressive with the connections from Ballard to Wallingford over to the University of Washington. I mean, with the east-west connections all the way across and then down south, the same, where neighbors are coming in and advising us, the government, about where do you want to see it? And the richness of Portland, um, and again, Greg Raisman and Greg Raisman and Mark Blair were the first to introduce me to this concept, is that neighbors would come and say, here's where we would like to have one. Their um, equivalent of SDOT is PBOT, and that's Portland Bureau of Transportation. Portland would come in and talk with the neighbors, but they wouldn't like drag it out for years, which is something that I think people talk about us in Seattle doing until we die. Um, the process is what will kill you. But in Portland, they'll have two meetings. They'll say, we're planning on doing it. What do you think? They come back in and they say, here's what we think. PBOC comes back in and says, here's what we're going to do. And they've done it. And that's why they've got to 65 miles in a matter of five years. I think that's a page that we can take out of their book. But I also understand and recognize that we need people to really be thoughtful about it, because otherwise, oh my god, even after we have 15 minutes, 15 meetings, we'll hear from people, we didn't hear. Nobody told us, nobody came in and asked our opinion. So it's always a constant balance. I just mentioned for the geographic area that we're talking about specifically, uh, Lake City Greenway is, is well organized, and Olympic Hills is going in soon. The, Olympic, the first one up in that area, the Hills Greenway, is going in very soon. What, is, what street is that? The 130th? 127. 127, 127. Yeah, well, good for you. Paul's had his hand up. Okay. I, I was just uh, getting back to uh, getting more people into ridership and getting back into now. Uh, in Copenhagen. And we're, we're moving beyond now. <laughs> I, I know, I know. We're moving. It's, it's, it's post now. But a uh, good way to get past. To get the post mammal is, as you know, in Copenhagen, Malmo, England, when people ride, they ride in their coats and ties, they ride in their regular clothes, they ride without helmets. And when the average citizen who's still went to his car and looks at the bike rider, they see them in high end latex, they see mammals out there, and fast bikes, and how fast can you get there? And I think psychologically, we need to change that to where, uh, you know, it's okay to go slower. It's okay to dress in your regular clothes. You don't have to have it. And I, I, I was going to suggest in certain areas of the city, uh, and they've, they've done this over there with their immigrant population, which are being introduced to bikes. We have a large immigrant population in Seattle, particularly southeast and 
central Seattle that where they came from, they used to riding bikes. Gee, if we could provide them with bikes and have them out there in their regular clothes, we who are long-term residents would see them and maybe follow that example. But I'm just saying that, that in order to get more people on the road to travel and act like they do in Copenhagen to safely traffic outside of the dedicated bikeways, we need to educate people that they can they, they don't have to spend a fortune on clothing. Can, can I give you a tip? The, the vehicle drivers are also really nice to you if you wear a skirt. Yeah, I was just going to say. So, <laughs> I, I, I bike to work almost every day, and this is what I bike in. Now, granted, I only live a mile and a half away from work, but this is what I bike in. Yeah. I look kind of silly on a bike sometimes, like this, no, this is but, uh, but I wear my normal clothes. More you should because be I don't have time to change, and I don't want to change, despite the fact that children's prevent great lockers and showers. <laughs> And life is too complicated in the morning to pack clothes and have them out nicely. But uh, it was Barbara Culp, who was the, uh, she used to work at Children's and the former executive director of uh, uh, Bicycle Alliance. She told me one day, wear a skirt, and the vehicle drivers are so nice to you. And it's true, actually, I have a, a sport that I wear, uh, that I wore almost every day on my bike, bike to work month. And people, even the bicycles were nice. They yeah. came up and said, oh, you're doing such a great job. <laughs> Has these I agree. Like three wheel bikes with kids that sit in the front and they, and they use them either to bike their kids or they bike their. I, I agree. But I think, like there's, big, big I think they're the vehicle drivers see themselves yes. or people see themselves more uh, with with people who are wearing, wearing normal clothes and not bike clothes. And it would be nice someday to be able to uh, bike for the bike, uh, dress for the destination, not the bike ride. And. Um, but I think you'll see more and more people out there doing that. There are a lot of skirts out there too, so keep your eyes open. <laughs> Yeah, it's for um, following up the, I can't remember your name, from Children's, I'm sorry. But uh, um, what advice would you have for agencies that kind of share this similar uh, value um, component that Children's has and um, some of the geographic issues that Children's ha has, you know, not on bus lines, um, the connectivity issues, um, but doesn't necessarily have the resources to, you know, put in the cycle track or do the $4 a day for parking and has like ample parking facilities. Um, how do you grapple with that conundrum? Well, I think children's is somewhat unique. They have resources that they can put into this, and not everybody has that level of resources. So I think I would kind of answer that from my, um, my work and experience with Commute Seattle, working with lots of different organizations who are looking to do the same thing, and they don't necessarily have the same resources. They're either, uh, many of them are you know, tiny uh, organizations, so large ones. I think the biggest one, if you want to change people's behavior about how they commute, uh, I think the single, uh, uh, the single greatest place to look and to, to change is parking. There are still uh, a large majority of uh, employers in Seattle and in the area who are paying for parking. The moment you stop paying for your employees' parking is the moment that it now becomes their decision on how to get to work. And as soon as it becomes their decision, they're interested in options and they're interested in improving those options. So I think, you know, that would be the first place to start is don't make a lot of investments uh, in all of these other things until you've at least done that. Take a look at uh, how you manage parking and then take a look at how to start making investments in uh, other alternatives. And some of them are, are not all that expensive, whether it's buying an Orca Pass for everybody, uh, providing a bike incentive, or a free bike. Uh, those also uh, turn out to be great uh, employee benefits, morale, and um, uh, they can uh, attract and retain talent. So there are a lot of sort of softer things that you can do uh, before you get into these large uh, um, infrastructure investments. I think one of the things that you said, Jamie, that I didn't know about was that you make people pay for parking irrespective of the time of day and there were no monthly passes. I think that's really, that's really true. If I had a monthly pass, you know, I would, my incentive would be to drive my car. But if I have to pay for it every single time, I'm going to think twice about that. I, I think you also have to start talking about health insurance. I, with, with the changes in the landscape that are going on right now, it pays for employers to start paying, to pay attention to their employees' health. And the health benefits of walking, biking, taking transit to work, far outweigh the exposure to some bad pollution or whatever you're going to get, uh, or the injury risk. 
there's studies that bear that out time and time again. And so employees encourage, or employers encouraging their folks to get to work hopefully is going to result in lower premiums over time for them, and it's something they should be paying attention to right now. King County has a phenomenal example of that, um, where they really incentivize their workers to do healthy things, and it lowers their rates over time. There's some great lessons learned there, uh, but I think that that's going to be one of the most powerful inroads to having that conversation with employers of all shapes and sizes. Yeah, Diana. So, last question. So thinking about not only your development, but also in terms of for pedestrians to safely be able to walk, you know, two or three miles to a location. Um, we often think uh, in terms of trails, right? So we design these like narrow pathways where it's like single file, rather than having a place for friends or families to walk together. So I'm wondering if we can step away from this concept of, a, of these tra walk trails to boulevards or safe walkways and really think about having some expanse. Um, and in terms of uh, for Gilman Trail, part of it is that it's just too narrow too. Not only do things need to be separated, but usually the walkers are off to the side, again, in single file. And so I'm wondering, and also with the, some of the monies that go in from the Department of Neighborhoods to put plantings in, it closes it in further. So, so I'm wondering if we could also look at expanding the width of the Burt Gilman and really accommodate people walking together in addition to separating them, only, in addition to separating them from the cyclists. That's a good idea. Uh, we've been working a lot downtown on that, for the boulevards, the new streets that are going in, the widening streets, to have sidewalks. You know, we still want to plant trees in them because it adds such a wonderful component of just that green, great feeling downtown. But in order to accommodate that, they need to be 12 feet or wider, um, and that's that's certainly something that we're working on. And it's just, just a comment I think about that is. Um, kind of good problem to have, which is I, I too went down and, and toured Portland and uh, got to talk to the Peabot folks there. And I asked them uh, at one point after looking at all the amazing stuff they'd done, I said, well, what, what's, what's your most pressing problem? And they said their facilities, whether bike lanes, walk lanes, um, um, staging areas for bikes and heads, uh, they said their number one problem was that those things weren't big enough. They were out of capacity. There was so much demand for this that their next biggest problem is how to make it bigger and expand it. So um, I agree the Burke Mailman Trail is not big enough, and uh, it's a good problem to have, and we'll have to figure that out in the future as we get more and more people biking and walking. All right. I think we're done at 5.30. Thank you.